Hey, welcome to this past Sunday's message from Stone Age Church. We are praying that it will be life transforming from wherever you are watching today. Join us now as we get into the message together. Good morning, Stone Edge Church. Good morning. Good morning. We are so excited this morning to introduce a wonderful family. They have been serving as missionaries in the region of Asia. Now, the Pollock family have been serving as missionaries in Indonesia, and they have been reaching out to both small and large communities over there and spreading the love of Christ and giving the people of Indonesia hope. Now we are so blessed to have them here today because this is a family that you have been supporting through Kingdom Builders. Yes, put your hands together for the Lord, hallelujah. And we're so confident that their message today would be an encouragement to us in that it will also be an example of faith in action that we can all follow. Yes, we've really enjoyed getting to know them. And the more we get to know you, we love you. And so um, there are two scriptures that the Lord laid on my heart like a few days ago. Um, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of the of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. That's Isaiah 52, seven. And then also, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, Romans 10, 15. So Stone Edge, we get to send them out and we get to pray for them and we get to love on them, but then they are also here to also encourage us and preach to us this morning. But we have a video that we want to show, that they want to show you all. So let's watch.
of Stone Edge Church, would you give a warm welcome to Tim and Kelly Pollock? So glad to have you guys with us. Thank you so much. Selamat pagi, saudara saudari. Oh, sorry. That's right. We're, we're in America now. That is good morning, my fellow friends, brother and sisters. Tim and I are missionaries to Medan, Indonesia. Medan is the city uh, in an island called Sumatra in the country of Indonesia. Indonesia has 17,000 islands and we live on one of them. So I just wanna show you a quick picture. We serve in Indonesia with our three amazing kids. We have two daughters and a son. Our first daughter, Amelia, she's six years old. And our second daughter, her name is Lizzie. She is four years old. And we have our son, his name is Timmy, or we call him Timmy, and he's two, but he's the size of like a five-year-old. So we like to say that he's part dinosaur, also because of how he acts. He's a crazy guy, but we are so blessed and so honored to serve in Indonesia as a family. As a mom, you know, it's really the best praise report that I can come to you today and say that our kids love Indonesia and our kids are thriving in our city and we're so blessed to be able to share that with you today. So it's really as, as parents and if you're a parent in the room, maybe you can understand that our number one focus is always on our kids and, and making sure that they're okay and they're doing amazing. So we're really blessed. We also have the amazing privilege to serve in our city as pastors of a church called International Church Medan, Medan being our city. And we have the words International Church in front of it just to tell the people in our area that we use English as our main way to preach and teach. Now that doesn't stop Indonesians from coming because our church is predominantly 92% made up of Indonesians. There's a big draw to learn Indonesian and English, or sorry, to learn English. And English also brings common ground to many different people groups that live within our city. And so if you see behind me, this is a picture of our church staff as we got away to bless our staff couple months ago. And so we're really honored and uh, we have been given a gift to serve in Indonesia. And it's really our privilege and our blessing to serve in this city and in, with these people. Our church, we've tried to uh, implement or speak to our people about three main areas that we can do missions and outreach within our city and in our nation. And so the first thing that we do is compassion outreach. Every single month, our church feeds 1,000 people. We have a group of volunteers that come together. We all cook it together, and then we go out into the city, into the slums, and we feed people a hot meal as well as a bag of rice, because rice, we eat it three times a day in Indonesia, and we miss it. <laughs> The next thing that we do is that in our church, we have partnership ministries that we partner with on a local basis. As you can see, the right picture here is a picture of an orphanage that our church financially supports as well as uh, sends a ministry team to that we send our people, our volunteers to go and minister to these people, to these kids and build a relationship with them. These kids also come and attend our church on a weekly basis. And we're so blessed to be a part of this orphanage because uh, our youth pastor now, he, he grew up in this orphanage for 17 years and he's now on staff with us serving with the church. So it's really, really, truly a blessing. The other picture you can see is a purple square. It's there for safety reasons, but we partner with the first teen challenge in Indonesia. And we're so blessed to be able to be a part of that. It's in the infancy stages, but we're so honored and blessed to be a part of a teen challenge that is a ministry for life controlling habits and bringing freedom in that way. The last or the next thing that we're a part of is a women's ministry. We have launched a women's ministry from our church and with Indonesia being the world's largest Muslim nation, many times women are seen as possessions, not as people. And so when we have said, hey, we have a ministry just for you, and our goal is that you would see, uh, receive healing, that you need healing and be encouraged, and we actually are encouraging them to reach out to their women. 
and they're the people that they know. And who knows that when a mom or a woman is changed, a whole family can be changed in an instant. Am I right? So we're so honored to be able to pour into these women's lives and see lives change time after time that we gather together. The last part of our church outreach program that we do is we have a goal to plant 10 churches by the year 2030. We have already completed the pictures you'll see behind me as our first church plant. Now, this isn't like I see made on in another city. It's its own sovereign church that we help to grow the leader, grow the pastor, as well as provide them with a building. And so you see the before and after pictures behind me. And this November will be our second church plant that we're going to be able to be a part of. So, Tim. I'm just going to ask you to stand one more time. To, to Let's pray together before we get into the Word of God. And as you stand, uh, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege, the honor of being able to be called your children. Lord, I thank you that we can go into places in the world and even here, Lord, wherever you've placed us to preach the gospel and see people's lives be changed. We love you, Lord. We pray now that you would open up our hearts and our ears to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. As you're seated, why don't you look to your neighbor? Go ahead now and look to the person next to you and say, you look like a million bucks today. Come on, make them feel good. And if you're sitting next to your spouse, tell them, baby, you look like two million bucks. Come on, yeah. Today, we're gonna be looking at the Word of God. The title of the message is All for the One. All right, so if you have your phone, your iPad, your whatever, open it up to Luke chapter eight. If you have a physical Bible, wave it in the air. I wanna shake your hand later because that's awesome. If you have an Android, throw it in the toilet and we'll talk after service. So if you've got your phone, turn to Luke chapter eight. We're gonna be reading a story now from the Bible that I think is perhaps one of the most transformational moments in Scripture. I wanna give you a little context of what's been going on. So if you read the beginning of Luke chapter eight, you'll see that Jesus is performing miracles and doing all of these amazing outreaches around the Sea of Galilee. Thousands of people are being healed. People are being set free. He's preaching, he's teaching. You know that in the Bible, wherever Jesus went, there were always multitudes of people that would gather. And the Bible even says that before Jesus could go somewhere else, what would happen? The people would find out and they'd run there before. And so in this story now, Jesus decides, I'm going to pause all of that amazing multiplied ministry and I'm gonna get into this boat with my disciples and go to the other side. As Jesus is in the boat, you might remember there's a big storm that happens and where's Jesus? He's in the boat sleeping. And so Jesus takes a nap, he, he wakes up, he calms the storm and he keeps going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to teach his disciples a very important lesson. I want to talk to you today about the importance of answering the call to reach the one. All through scripture, the Bible talks about God caring about one more. He'll leave the 99 to go after the one that's been lost. He came to seek and save the lost. And in this story now that we're going to read today, it explains how we're supposed to answer that call. You've probably heard your pastor or other missionaries talk about answer the call to reach the lost, answer the call to go somewhere, answer the call to missions. And, and I just got to be honest with you. I didn't grow up in another country. Okay. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Can I get an amen? No, because we're in Georgia. All right. I'll give myself an amen. All right. So I grew up in a small town of 2000 people. My friends drove their lawnmowers to school. I'm not kidding. That's not an exaggeration. We got off school for deer season. Now I can get an amen for that one. All right. So I grew up like that and I didn't quite understand how I was supposed to answer the call to reach the one. Let's look now in verse 26, Luke chapter eight, verse 26. The Bible says this. So they arrived in the region of the Gerasenes across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. And this is important. For a long time, he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. So Jesus takes his disciples and he says, okay, we're going to pause all of this stuff that you can see, all the thousands of people and all the great things that are happening. We're going to get into a boat and cross to the other side because I want you to meet somebody. I want to show you now that there's something specific about this region. Now, you might not know this from the text. You'd have to dig a little bit into the history, but the region of the Gerasenes had never yet heard the gospel, the good news. They'd never yet heard that Jesus was here to bring freedom and healing in people's lives that don't know him. And so Jesus now is doing something of an object lesson. He's taking his disciples to meet with one person. 
It was about a year and a half ago now that Kelly and I were in our church building in our office. Uh, she didn't mention this, but our church is situated inside a mall, okay? So if you've ever been to Asia, malls are still alive. People are, people are going to the mall because there's no Amazon, okay? So we go to the mall because we can do stuff there, and it's free air conditioning. So Indonesia is about 95 degrees every day of the year. It doesn't change, and it rains all day, so it's humid and yucky, and so people want to go inside. So the church is in the mall, and people who go there can kind of find the church and see what's going on. So one day, a girl comes into our church and asks to meet with us. So I you know, asked her into my office. Kelly was there, and we met with her. She's about 20 years old, and she looked at me and said, you don't know who I am, but I study at the university on the ninth floor. And I'm like, okay, how can I help you? And she said, yeah, I've studied all the religions there are, and I've come to a conclusion. None of them make sense except Christianity. And I'm like, yes, I agree with you. Like, I'm a, you know you're in a church, right? Like, this is great. I love you. And, and how can I help you? And she said, I came to this conclusion because none of the religions offer hope except Christianity. And at that point, I'm like, girl, you want to preach on Sunday? Like, this is great. I don't know what we're doing here. And, and I didn't really say that. And I just kind of looked at her. And, and she looked down on the floor. And then she looked back up at me and Kelly and said, I'm Buddhist and my entire family is Buddhist and we've always been Buddhist. And to be honest, I don't think I'm allowed to be a Christian. And then she paused again and looked at me and Kelly and said, no, you don't understand. I have no hope in my life. Actually, on the way to come and meet with you, I tried to take my life six times. And I looked at this girl and I, and I did the best I could in that moment. There's not much you can say. We just kind of talked a little bit about the gospel and she just kept nodding her head because she already knew it. And then she looked up at me and said, am I allowed to be a Christian today? And I said, oh, would you like to? Because you can. And she said, oh, very much so. So we prayed together. And I remember that moment that there are people in this world that don't know that they have hope. Many times we can look at the lost people around us or the people we might know or people in different countries and we think they're so far removed from God and they're never gonna get out of that. And now Jesus is teaching us the first thing I wanna tell you today. If you're gonna answer the call to reach the one just like he is showing his disciples, you need to understand this today. You and I were called to take back territory in Jesus' name. The first thing you gotta see today and the first thing I wanna teach you is you and I were called to take back territory. There's something powerful that happens in this story. Jesus isn't just showing them a new country or showing them a new place. He's saying, this place belongs to me. No matter what the situation or the circumstance, and it sure happened to be that this man was homeless and naked and controlled by demons. So let's keep reading now in verse 28. The Bible says, as soon as he saw Jesus, this is the man, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. And then he screamed, why are you interfering with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. The spirit had often taken control of the man. Even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit, and there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. This is a powerful, supernatural moment. Jesus now shows up in a place that's never heard the gospel, and there's one man, and he's been controlled. He's been naked. He's been homeless. He's been living in the tombs. He would get shackles put on him, and he would rip them off. You can, you can see him now. He's, he's in a place where he's not kept well, and he's got bloodshot eyes, and he's probably foaming at the mouth, and he's got all of this going against him. And Jesus says, but no, listen, you belong to me. The situation looks like you're so far from me, but you're just broken and hurting, and I'm here to bring you freedom and healing. There's something we need to understand today, that God is all about the one who's far from him, and when Jesus comes in contact with that one, they are freed and they are made whole in Jesus' name. So Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I want you to learn this. It doesn't matter how far or how lost or how stubborn or how hopeless or how broken or hurting somebody is, 
They are not lost to the powers of darkness. They belong to me. Let me give you this suggestion today, church. There might be people in your life that you know like that. And God said, if you want to answer the call to reach the one, you have the authority to take back territory for Jesus Christ. You get to walk into the situations of people's life who are broken and hurting, and you can say, in Jesus' name, you are set free and you will be made whole. And let me just give you advice on how to do that. Go to where people are broken and hurting. I'm not a missionary. I'm not a pastor. I, I don't have any training. I don't know how to do this. I'm busy. I've got five kids. Whatever this story is, God didn't call you to do any of those things. He, he called you to go to where people are broken and hurting. So whatever your life looks like, it's on purpose because God knows who you are, where you're going, what you're designed to do. And he's put people all around you who are broken and hurting. And all you have to do is go into their life and say, Jesus is here to set you free. This is what he's starting to teach his disciples as they've crossed the Sea of Galilee, take back territory in my name by going to where people are broken and hurting. Now it says in verse 33, and this is where it gets really interesting. Let's keep reading. Well, then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. And then verse 35 says, people rushed out to see what happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been freed from the demon. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all filled with faith. Can I get an amen? No, they were all terrified. They were afraid. Picture with me now, here's the man that's been living in the tombs. He's been living in the cemetery. He's been screaming out at night. He's homeless, he's naked, he's powerful. And, and here comes this Jesus with these people that followed him and they go to this region and now all of a sudden this supernatural event occurs and everybody's terrified. So about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, I went on a missions trip inside of Indonesia. I joined with some local pastors and we went to the witchcraft capital of the nation, all right? So on the island of Borneo, there's, there's, a, there's a town there that's known as the witchcraft capital of the nation. I went with a group of local pastors because I wanted to learn and I wanted to, to, to see what was going on and, and be encouraged. And so every day from six in the morning until seven o'clock in the evening, we had training. So this was local style training. You're in one room, one light bulb, one ceiling fan, no AC, 95 degrees. Can I get an amen? All right. So it's real biblical like that. And so I was in there all day learning about spiritual deliverance in another language. So my mind is exploding with pain and, and suffering and I loved it and I'm in the back of the room and then at 7 p.m. right after training ends, we go into a revival service. All right, so from seven o'clock now, we've invited people from the community. They're coming in because we knew that the community doesn't come to church. It doesn't go to the temple. It doesn't go to the mosque. It goes to the witch doctor, including the pastor's. All right, so everybody's going to the witch doctor to get, get, to get a curse over their life for some kind of protection. And so we invited these people in. If you've ever been to a revival service in another country, there's a keyboard player that's just like, they won't, they can't stop. They won't stop. Like, we love them. I don't know. I said this earlier. Yeah, dude, you are the man. Like you, he never stops. So he's up here for like three hours. And then all of a sudden there's a speaker in the middle of the room that's exploding with fire because it's like one little tiny speaker and it's trying to fill the room. And all these people start coming down to the front to get prayed for. So I see the local pastors, they're, they're praying for people. And, and some of the people, one by one, start to manifest and do some weird stuff. And, and I'm in the back of the room and I'm just worshiping with the keyboard player. I'm like, this is great. Like, Lord, you're setting people free. Hallelujah. You know, th this person appears like screaming and hollering. And then all of a sudden you see them get set free and, and they're peaceful. And then all of a sudden I opened my eyes and I saw one man standing in the front alone. I saw this man and I thought to myself, oh Lord, please send somebody to this man to pray for him. Like, I guess we don't have enough people on this team. Thank you, Lord. And I opened my eyes and he's still alone. And I'm like, yes, Lord, soon and very soon he's going to have. And I had this moment and the Lord convicted me and said, you know, that's your guy. And I was like, no, Lord, he belongs to you. <laughs> I'm like, touch him like only you can. And so eventually, if you've ever wrestled with the Lord, you can't win, okay? So I, I, I walked down to the front and I w walked up to this man. He's about this tall. And I felt in that moment that 
I'm just going to pray a simple prayer in Indonesian, di dalam nama Tuhan Yesus sembu, which means in the name of Jesus be made whole. And I looked at this man, he looked so troubled, his face was kind of like this, and he's standing there real stiff. I put my hand on his shoulder and prayed that prayer, and sure enough, as I went to turn around, I could see out of the corner of my eye, he was about to fall over, so I was like, wow, this is so spiritual, I'm such a good missionary. And I grabbed him, and I gently put him on the floor, and I'm like, yeah, like I did it, like this is great. And I walked back toward the, toward the back of the room, and as I got to the front row of chairs, I heard something that I'd never heard before in my life. And this man starts screaming and his body gets rigid and his back is, is arching up. His eyes are wide open and bloodshot. He's foaming at the mouth. And I remember thinking to myself in that moment, I stopped dead in my tracks and I turned around and I looked straight at the guy who was leading our training. And I thought in that moment, I am not qualified for this. So thankfully, Several of our pastor friends, we came and we actually had to pick up this guy to, to not, you know, we didn't want to make him feel uncomfortable. We didn't want to distract other people. We brought him into a back room. There happened to be a small back room in that, in that area. And, and I had a plastic chair in my hand. I don't remember why I had this plastic chair in my hand, but I walked into that room because I didn't know what else to do. And I had a chair in my hand and the guy leading our seminar looked at the man who was manifesting like crazy. And he said, be quiet in Jesus name. Boom. And the man fell down into the plastic chair that I was holding. We were able to talk to this man. I silenced the demons and spoke to the man. And we found that he had invited seven demonic forces into his life through the curses of the witch doctor to protect him. And we looked at the man who had been controlled for years, very much like the man that Jesus interacts with in Luke chapter eight. He was controlled by the demon's power. And he looked at us, this man looked at us and said, I don't want this anymore. I want to be set free and I want to be made whole. There's parts of my body that are now controlled and not functioning properly. There's things in my mind that are broken. All of this has now controlled me. I want to be free. And we began to talk to the man and we invited him to pray along with us. And we said, okay, now you, you pray with us in the name of Jesus be gone. And he would, he would start to pray in the name of Jesus. And then he would start to kind of have this struggle because the demon wouldn't want to leave. And I know this is so hard to understand. Believe me, I grew up in Pittsburgh, okay? I, 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 didn't, I didn't get all this when I was younger, and I would hear people like me talking, and I'm like, no, that's not true, or I can't really picture that until you see it, and then God sets someone free. And this is what Jesus was showing the disciples. It's one thing to, to show up in a place and say, this territory belongs to Jesus and I'm now here where people are broken and hurting. But to be honest, I got to that point in my life where I said, I'm answering the call. I'm gonna go do something. I'm gonna go somewhere where, where people don't know Jesus and I'm gonna tell them that they belong to God. But then I got there and I didn't know what to do. There's something else that God wants you to learn today. And let me give you the second thing. If the first thing is you are called to take back territory by going to where people are broken and hurting, when you get there, you are called to proclaim his name. Let me give you the second thing. You are called to not just take back territory. When you get there, you are called to proclaim his name. And so watch what happens in verse 36. Then those who had seen what happened told the others. So now the, the demons have left the man. Everybody sees what happens. The pigs are gone. And they tell people how the demon-possessed man had been healed. All the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. For a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. Let me just pause there for a minute. May we never be a church that's so focused on understanding that we look at the King of Kings and say, I can't handle this right now. You need to go. Jesus actually gave them what they wanted. They were afraid of the supernatural nature of things. And many times in my personal life, I couldn't rationalize it. So I pushed it away and God gave me exactly what I wanted. But now I'm praying, Lord, would you bring freedom and healing in my life and through ministry and through the church? Because that's what people need. They need to be set free. They need to be made whole and they need to come into a relationship with Jesus because when they do, they realized that they didn't belong to the power of darkness anymore. They belonged to the King of Kings. And I don't want to push that away. And so this is what happens. The people are afraid. They ask Jesus to leave. He left. Verse 38. Now, this is the most important part of the story. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with Jesus. 
I can imagine him thinking to, to himself, I was just set free. I was controlled. I'm made whole. I gotta go. I gotta go on a mission. I gotta go to, t- to territory that doesn't know about Jesus. I gotta go to where people are broken and hurting and I gotta go answer the call to missions and I gotta do that in my community. And, and Jesus looks at the man and he says this in verse 39. No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up as I finish the story with you today. I could be wrong. This is perhaps one of the only times that Jesus looks at somebody and says, don't follow me. Don't come along for the journey. Go back to your family. See, you were called to not just take back territory, to go to where people are broken and hurting. You were called to proclaim his name. Do you know what that word proclaim means? It simply means to praise God publicly. And I don't know about you, but if there's one place I struggle with that the most, it's my own family. Oh, you don't understand. They've, they're, they're upset with the Lord. They've been hurt. They're, they're bitter. Something happened. They were abused. And, and whatever the circumstance, it seems to be one of the hardest things to go back to our own family and tell them what Jesus has done in our life. But that's exactly what this man did. It says that he went through all the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done. I found something to be true. We're not just called to take back territory, but once we get there, we're called to proclaim his name. Look at what Jesus has done in my life. Oh, but I'm not a missionary. I'm not a pastor. I don't know how to speak. I don't know. I don't have any skill. Okay, I grew up in Pittsburgh, guys. I get that. Like, I I felt that same way. And, And then the Lord said, okay, go there. And now once you get there, bring freedom through your praise. That's my suggestion to you today, by the way. If there's people in your life that are broken and hurting and maybe you've inserted yourself and you've said, you don't belong to darkness, you don't belong to addiction, you don't belong to guilt, you don't belong to shame, you belong to Jesus. And I'm here in your life now and guess what you do in that moment? You begin to praise God. Look what he's done in my life. Am I perfect? Absolutely not, but Jesus is all powerful. Look what he's doing in my marriage. Am I perfect? No, but Jesus is gonna bring complete healing. Look at what God has done through me. And you go on and you go on and you go on and you bring freedom through your praise because that's exactly what Jesus taught us to do. It's all about the one. It's all about one more. He paused all of the massive ministry to the multitudes to teach his disciples the heart of God. The heart of God is all about the one. So we looked at this man, we prayed for him for about an hour and a half, took a while to to confront all these demonic forces. And one by one, we saw them go. And, you know, he would kind of have a moment where he would release something or throw up or whatever. And so we saw the man set free. And I want to share a picture with you now. Go ahead and put that up behind me. There he is. He's completely set free from seven demons. And he came up to me and it was kind of funny. He looked at me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, In English, I guess this is about the extent of his English. He said, can I have a selfie? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) He's like, okay. So we took a selfie together. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He said, I got to go tell people what happened to me. I'm going to go back and tell people how Jesus set my life. That's what God is calling you and me to do. Why don't you stand with me this morning as we close our time together? I want to pray for you. And pray over this church. Pastor Joey will come in a moment to close. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. If you want to, just put your hands in front of you like this. I want to pray pray a blessing over your life today. Father God, I pray for your people in this church. God, I pray for this body of believers. I pray, Lord, right now that you would anoint them and empower them with the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you've called us to take back territory and the authority of Jesus Christ. You've called us to go to where people are broken and hurting. And some of the most broken and hurting people are right here in our families. So Lord, give us the courage, the boldness, and the strength to proclaim your name and praise you publicly and to bring freedom, Lord, as we praise you and tell of what you've done. This is what you've designed us to do. This is what you've called us to do. And I pray that now in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. Yeah, amen. You can clap. Well worth it. Great job, Tim. Great job. So this morning at this time, I'd like to ask our altar team members, if you guys would, and ladies would make your way to the front. There's a very specific way that I want to end the service today. Pastor Tim talked about the one. He talked about Jesus leaving the 99 and going for the one. Maybe, maybe today, maybe you're, you're the one. Maybe you're the one that Jesus is reaching out to and and saying, I want you to come and follow me. 
Maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. There's no greater time right now than for you to say, Jesus, forgive me, be my Lord and Savior. Help me to serve you every day of my life. Maybe, maybe you're that one. And today you need to give your life to Christ. In just a moment, if that's you, I'm just gonna ask that you would respond and let us pray with you to begin that new journey with Jesus. Or maybe you're here and you heard the stories of people that were struggling with all kinds of things and maybe you're in the room today and you're struggling. There's something that you're battling. Maybe it's a spiritual battle. Maybe it's a, a physical battle. Maybe it's an emotional battle. But we wanna pray with you right before you leave the service today. Maybe you're that one. Maybe you're praying for the one. Maybe there's someone in your family that you've been praying for for a long time and you just wanna gather with another believer to say, would you pray with me for my one? So right now, this moment is crafted and is set aside for you. So in a moment, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna go back into a, a time of worship. And as we go back into that time of worship, if you are the one, if you're struggling with something, or maybe you're praying for the one, I wanna encourage you to step out, make your way down to the front and let someone pray with you right before we leave the auditorium today. Let's pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would remove every hindrance. You would remove every inhibition you would remove every barrier that people will, will raise up in their lives to keep them from responding to your word. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that those that need to would respond to the calling that you are placing in them to respond to let someone pray with them today. It's in your beautiful name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. To connect with us and for more information about Stone Edge Church, head over to our website. And if there is anything that we can be praying with you about right there on our website, you can let us know and we'll be reaching out to you. Thanks so much again for joining us. We'll see you soon.